writer of this hymn was a sister little known to the world or Christianity, but who at the beginning of the 20th century occupied a paramount place in the Lord's move in China. It was through her that Watchman Nee, a seer of the divine revelation in the present age, was introduced to the way of life. In the next 30 minutes, we want to look at the life and time of this marvelous yet hidden vessel of God whose hymns and life have touched thousands of lives and have become an encouragement to generations afterwards. <music> Margaret Emma Barber was born in 1866 in Peasant Hall in County Suffolk in the south of England, the daughter of Lewis and Martha Barber. According to the records of the Family Records Center, her father was a wheelwright, one who repairs wheels, and as such, she would have been raised in a rather humble environment. In 1890, when she was 24, a call was made in faraway China by Hudson Taylor at the Conference of Protestant Missionaries of China. We do now appeal to you, the Protestant churches of Christian lands, to send to China in response to these calls 1,000 men within five years from this time. We make this appeal in behalf of 300 millions of unevangelized heathen. We make it with all the earnestness of our whole hearts as men overwhelmed with the magnitude and responsibility of the work before us. Within exactly five years of such a call, in 1895, M. E. Barber set sail for China under the direction and with the support of the Church Missionary Society of London. By February of the following year, she arrived in Hong Kong, and in March, in Fuchao. Dear Mr. Baringold, it was lovely to rest on our Father's words, He shall cover thee, as we stepped for the first time upon this soil and realized perhaps as never before the honor God had put upon us. It was one of the happiest days of my life when I really landed in China. Margaret E. Barber, March 6, 1896. 
Soon after arriving, she was assigned to the village of Kung Tao, together with two other lady missionaries, and she immediately immersed herself in the needs around her. Because of the poor condition of her dwelling, she was asked to move back to the city. Dear Mr. Baring Gold, I am extremely sorry to hear from Mr. Lloyd that there is a probability that we may get orders from England to leave our station and go to Fu Chao. I am writing to ask you to allow us to remain here. When Dr. Taylor was here, our house was being sealed. Since this work has been done, the difference has been wonderful. Before the house was sealed, the strong winds, which are so cold and searching on the sea coast, come sweeping up through the cracks in the boards. We could never get warm anywhere. The malaria, if there is any, will also now be prevented from rising. The work here is glorious more and more, and there is plenty for us all three to do. With kind regard, I am yours faithfully, Margaret E. Barber, March 16, 1898. Fu Chao, at the turn of the century, was a bustling city. It lies on both sides of the Min River at the estuary. To the north of the river was the old city proper. To the south, a community of more recent development, mainly spurred by the settlement of foreigners and Christian missions. In the middle of the river, an island, and spanning the river was an old bridge, the Thousand Year Bridge, built of huge chunks of ancient rocks. Here, Miss Barber was assigned to teach at the Tao Su Girls High School for seven years. Woo me, O Lord, from easy paths, whose flowers I gather as I go, that I, a deeper fellowship with Thee, may daily, hourly know. Speak to me, Lord, that as I climb the steeper heights, my soul may hear thy voice, which never fails to nerve my heart and drive away my fear. And if, dear Lord, the flesh would fain forsake the heights, forego the prize, fasten on me thy look of love and make me meet thy searching eyes. Thus woo me, Speak to me, and be the light to lead me on and on, until those glorious heights are gained, where Thou, O Christ, are Holy One. Because of the rich life of Christ, overflowing in her excellent living, many students were attracted and desired Miss Barber's instruction. This made the principal jealous of her. The principal accused her of ten illegal matters. While she was being carefully examined, she had a feeling before the Lord. If the thumb argues with the little finger, it only hurts the head. So I should just leave this school. She was completely obedient to Christ and quietly left the school. Even so, a list of her crimes was sent to the parent committee of the British mission. During that time, she was learning to remain silent under the shadow of the cross. Preferring rather to suffer misunderstanding than defend herself, she said nothing in answer to the false charges. She returned to England and continued her silence, offering no vindication. One of her fellow missionaries, however, eventually related the truth of the situation to the director responsible for the mission. Realizing that she had placed herself under the authority of the cross, he finally told her, As your authority, I charge you to tell me the facts of what happened in China. Don't hide anything. Submitting herself to God's delegated authority, she finally told him the truth of what had happened, and her case was cleared. A 
Around this time, she met Brother D. M. Panton, the editor of the Christian magazine called The Dawn. She received much help and light from Panton. He was clear about the matter of division. He also knew the prophecies of the Bible and the truths concerning overcoming. He influenced her to live as a person waiting for the Lord's return. During the two years that she remained in England, she exercised faith and prayed that the Lord would open the way for her to go back to work in China. Finally, in 1909, with fellowship from D.M. Panton and the Surrey Chapel of Norwich, where he ministered, she returned to China. This time, there was no big mission to support her. She would go, and she would live by faith. Her niece, a Miss Ballard, who was 20 years her junior, accompanied her to China. Miss Ballard had her own small savings, but M. E. Barber had only the Lord of Psalm 23 as her supply. While the ship crossed the Min River in China, she quietly looked to the Lord in dependence for her needs and her future. About an hour's boat ride from Fu Chao, farther down the Min River lay the little port of Pagoda Anchorage, where the water is deeper and larger ocean vessels take anchor. The landmark Lo Xing Pagoda is there. Across the bay from this harbor was a little village known as Bai Ya Tan. Here, M. E. Barber chose to make her new home, and from here she could catch a lovely view of the Min River and the Pagoda Anchorage across the bay. This is the spot where M. E. Barber's house was situated. In this clearing once stood a row of ten wooden houses. The landlord was a sister, Sister Sha, who was the principal of an orphanage. This was for M. E. Barber, her promised land. It was here that she pitched a tent and built an altar for the next twenty years. One year, the landlord decided that she needed the houses for the orphanage. She asked Miss Barber to move, and she sent workmen to make repairs on the houses. However, Miss Barber continued to trust God that He would not go against what He had promised. With confidence, she prayed, "O、oh、Father, I beg you to make Your promise firm." In the end. The landlord sent someone to tell her that the repaired houses were hers to live in. She resided there until her departure to be with the Lord in 1930. In the church assembly hall in Bayatan, we met a man whose father served as Miss Barber's cook during her stay in the village. Sister Barber came here to preach the gospel in 1911. She traveled to the neighboring villages to see if anyone would believe in the Lord. No one then knew the name of Jesus, and she began to preach the gospel. My father and my grandmother both moved here, and later he served as her cook. At that time, no one was a believer, and she began to preach the gospel in the nearby villages. She would come to your home and preach, while you would be cooking and burning firewood, and she would sit down and help in the work. While speaking God's word to you slowly, bit by bit. In such a hidden way, Miss Barber began her ministry. Even though outwardly there was little result to her work, inwardly she was breathing in the heavenly air and gaining deeper fellowship with the resurrected Christ. One of her hymns expressed such a deep experience of the Lord, and in particular in His precious name.
Hers was not the ministry of power and great outward achievement, but rather of a life lived within the veil, through the cross, in the heavenlies. Once someone asked her, What are the requirements to work for the Lord? She replied, The requirement to work for the Lord is not to work. Some of the Chinese young people who received help from her were worried about her. They wondered, why doesn't she go out and establish meetings and work in a bigger city? It seemed that it was a waste for her to live in a small village where nothing outwardly was happening. But did not Mary do the same when she poured out the precious ointment on her beloved Lord? The Lord charged that such an act, which fragrance filled the house, should be told of wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. Footnote 1 from Matthew chapter 26 verse 8 in the recovery version of the New Testament says, Throughout the past 20 centuries, thousands of precious lives, heart treasures, high positions, and golden futures have been wasted upon the Lord Jesus. To those who love him in such a way, he is altogether lovely and worthy of their offering. What they have poured upon him is not a waste, but a fragrant testimony of his sweetness. For two weak sisters, the thought of evangelizing the vast land of China seemed but a distant dream. But they soon realized that God would raise up young people from among the Chinese population for his own sake. For this, they were willing to bury themselves as seeds in the ministry of prayer for ten long years. God finally answered their prayers. During the tenth year of their seemingly fruitless labor, a revival broke out in Fuchao. Among those raised up at that time were Leland Wong, K.H. Wei, Faithful Luke, Wilson Wong, and many other young brothers and sisters. These would frequently go to Miss Barber to receive training and spiritual instruction. To meet the many spiritual needs, Miss Barber prepared a group of houses around her residence for the purpose of hospitality. She would conduct training classes in some of these houses, but it was the private fellowship and long personal talks that became the greatest edification and perfecting for one particular young seeker named Watchman Nee. Whenever he had a problem or needed spiritual instruction or strengthening, he would go to M. E. Barber. She treated him as a young learner and frequently administered strict discipline. We had a co-workers meeting every Friday in which the other five were forced to listen to the arguing between the two of us. After having a dispute on Friday, I would go to Sister Barber on Saturday and accuse the other co-worker. Whether that co-worker is wrong or not is another matter. While you are accusing your brother before me, are you like one who is bearing the cross? Are you like a lamb? When she questioned me in this way, I felt very ashamed and I could never forget it. My speech and my attitude that day revealed that I was indeed not like one bearing the cross, not like the Lamb. Everything about Miss Barber bore a touch of the Lord's presence. Watchman Nee often told of a time when he went to visit her in her home. Even while waiting for her in her living room, he had a deep sense of the Lord's presence. In one of her papers, she had written, I want nothing for myself. I want everything for the Lord. This was her prayer to the Lord. Later, Watchman Nee adopted this impressive prayer as his motto. Day by day, Miss Barber anticipated the Lord's return. 
on the last day of 1925, as she and Watchman Nee were praying together. She prayed, Lord, will you really let the year 1925 pass away? Although it is the last day of the year, I still ask you, Lord, to come today. Sometime later, as the two of them walked together, they neared a corner. She said, Perhaps as we turn the corner, we will meet him. To her, the Lord's return was not a doctrine, but a living hope which governed her work and living. Quietly, in the remote village of Bayatan, a different kind of missionary and pioneer was slowly charting the course of another field, the field of life and resurrection in the divine and mystical realm. The daily beautiful vista of these little boats along the Min River would likely have given her the inspiration to write about the even more beautiful and serene life of faith which she now possessed. Like milk and honey, is the outflow of a life that has learned lessons and is dealt with. This cannot happen in one day and one night. After living a hidden life in that remote corner of the world for 20 years, at the end of February 1930, she contracted enteritis, a disease of the intestines today commonly known as Crohn's disease. Within a short time, she concluded her 63 years of earthly pilgrimage. It is said that before she departed, she was shouting, Life! Life! In a package of personal belongings which was given to Watchman Nee upon her death, was a note which said, 
dear Lord, I thank you because you have a commandment saying you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Personal belongings which was given to watch Mani upon her death was a note which said, Dear Lord, I thank you because you have a commandment saying you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. She was buried in the village of Baigatan. On her gravestone were engraved the words, The resting place of Miss M. E. Barber. May a double portion of her spirit be upon us. Today, visitors cannot readily find her gravesite. We were fortunate enough to meet Mr. Wong, who talked about her burial site. <laughs> She was buried back in the hills, up there. That is a place for foreigners, a plot for foreigners to be buried. There were two or three dozen people buried there. They were all foreigners from Fuchao. Some who lived in Fuchao were also buried there. We called it the Cemetery for Xiangzai, a nickname for foreigners. Mr. Wang led us to her grave. We walked and walked up the hill on an unpaved dirt road. Finally, we turned and came to a grassy, deserted knoll halfway up the lane. This is the place where Miss M. E. Barber was buried. They were not covered up. Originally, there were people guarding the graves. There was even a wall at one time with custodians. But after the communists came, the custodians were gone. By 1960, we were having a famine and no one was fed well. The graves were destroyed and the plot was converted into a potato field. Here, with a panoramic view of the land and the country that she loved and had sacrificed her entire life for, M. E. Barber was laid to rest. It was a long journey from the little English hamlet to the faraway land of Fuchao, China. She followed the footsteps of her master and became a drink offering to satisfy the one she loved supremely. Through such sacrifice, she also became the channel through which the Lord raised up Watchman Nee, one great vessel in the 20th century, and through that ushered in the great move of God's economy in this present age. So